Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome. Uh, my name is Ian Markham. I'm Dean and President of Virginia Theological Seminary. I'm delighted to welcome you here to the 2018 Mollagen Forum. This year's Mollagen Forum is also the first event in a two-day consultation organized by our Center for Anglican Communion Studies, which is entitled Reconceiving Reconciliation, Workplaces that connect the world. We extend a special welcome to the participants and mentors uh, who join us today. Welcome also to those who are joining us uh, via the live stream. We're delighted you're here with us as well. And the Reverend Dr. Albert T. Mollagen taught New Testament and Ethics at Virginia Theological Seminary from 1936 until 1974. Dr. Mollagen was a powerful and charismatic teacher who was deeply committed to an ongoing conversation between the church and wider society. Against this backdrop, the Mollagen Forum was established to help carry on this heritage of ethical and theological engagement with the world. In these forums, we're invited to listen, to think, and to imagine with a distinguished panel. Given the esteem that Virginia Seminary holds Professor Mollagen in, we're particularly pleased to honor him, and today we welcome his family. Please recognize Ted Mollagen, his son. Thank you, sir. The Mollagen Forum is hosted by a Center for Anglican Communion Studies, and let me just pause and say, uh, never underestimate the complexity of an event of this nature. And I do ask us to recognize the team in CACS who worked so hard, uh, Robert, Molly, uh, Hartley, and all the seminarians. Please, a round of applause for their hard work. <laughs> this year, we have partnered in this venture with the Washington National Cathedral and the Northern Ireland Bureau. And we're delighted that the director of the Northern Ireland Bureau, Mr. Norman Houston, OBE, is present with us. Please, sir, let's recognize <laughs> Mr. Houston. In a moment, I'm going to hand events over to the director of the Center for Anglican Communion Studies to formally introduce our keynote speaker and panelists. Let me, however, be the first to welcome Senator George Mitchell, Mitchell former United States Special Envoy for Northern Ireland for the Middle East. And in response to Senator Mitchell, we will have a distinguished panel. We welcome the founder of the Women's Coalition and Campaigner for Justice and for Integrated Education in Northern Ireland, Baroness May Blood, the Archbishop of Canterbury's advisor for Anglican Communion Affairs, Bishop Anthony Pogo, activist and leader for reconciliation in the Church of Sudan and South Sudan, a leader of, in the Archbishop of Canterbury's Women on the Frontline Ministry, Mr. Jane Bassa Pogo, and the Archbishop of Canterbury's advisor for reconciliation, Canon Sarah Snyder. And finally, the coordinator of cultural agility in the Reformed Church in America, Mr. Earl James. You are all very much welcome. We're pleased you're here. And now I hand the mic over to our hardworking director of the Center for Anglican Communion Studies, Dr. Robert Heaney. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Dean Markham. My name is uh, Robert Heaney. Um, of course, I'm the director for our Center for Anglican Communion Studies uh, here at Virginia. It, I echo the Dean's uh, welcome of our esteemed guests today. My one minute elevator speech about the Center for Anglican Communion Studies. Time me. Virginia Theological Seminary Center for Anglican Communion Studies exists to promote and practice better community for the communion. Our work is international, intercultural, interreligious. Three imperatives shape our work, reflect, resource, reconcile. We create space for Episcopalians and their neighbors to reflect theologically amidst affection and disaffection. We produce resources to equip people of faith in life-giving practice. This means consultations, it means research, it means uh, publications, but most of all, it means uh, relationships. Alert to our own weaknesses, we work for best practices 
in reconciliation. Right now, we're partnering with religious leaders in North America, East Africa, West Africa, and the Middle East in such uh, ventures. The motto is simple. It reflects our hope and our prayers. We exist to promote deeper and better community. It's my great honor to have the pleasure to welcome Mr. Norman Houston, OBE, Director of the Northern Ireland Bureau, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Norman, you're most welcome. Reverend Dr. Heaney, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here in the seminary this afternoon, but a distinct honor to have the opportunity to introduce Senator George Mitchell. Anyone with even a um, very cursory knowledge of Northern Ireland history will know of the pivotal role that George Mitchell played in Northern Ireland's peace process. Two decades ago, the people of Northern Ireland had a choice to choose a new accommodation, a political accommodation, which would bring peace or stay within an internecine conflict that had killed over 3,500 people and injured many more. The man who is with us this afternoon had the unenviable task of bringing together people who had not even exchanged a word with one another, let, let alone be in the same room. What is so special about Senator George Mitchell? Well, I can tell you a few things. It is his patience, his innate, innate sense of justice, and his unassuming and genuine personality. For a man with such a distinguished history as George Mitchell, his moral compass points firmly to his rural upbringing in Maine and the principles of integrity and humility which were drummed into him by his loving family. It is those traits that have made the man who's before us today. I was 40 years old in 1998 with two young children and I knew that the future for Northern Ireland could be different, in fact better than I could even imagine. The Good Friday Agreement has brought peace and prosperity to the small region of Western Europe that I call home. We have experienced an exponential rise in inward investment, mostly from the United States, and our tourism figures have literally gone through the roof. And for the first time since the Second World War, our unemployment rate is less than 4%. Peace and stability are the foundations of our vibrant economy and I am honored to represent Northern Ireland in this great nation. Ladies and gentlemen, George Mitchell's career and accolades are not confined to Northern Ireland. His record in the US Senate and his peace building skills overseas make him a truly international statesman. He is a recipient of among other things, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Liberty Medal, and he has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. But from a purely personal perspective, I want to thank him, not as a diplomat, but as a father and as a friend. Because, because of George Mitchell, my children grew up in a normal society where the troubles are a history lesson and not a way of life. Please join me in welcoming Senator George Mitchell. Well, thank you very much, Norman, for that uh, very generous introduction. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your warm reception. It's really a pleasure for me to participate in this Mulligan Forum. Uh, since 1823, this seminary has prepared Christian leaders for public service. Your missionary tradition means that people of faith make local connections in their ministry, but also make life-giving connections across cultures and across religious divides. Episcopalians are, of course, connected to a globalized faith through the Anglican communion. Given both the gift and the challenge that comes with belonging to an 85 million strong families across 165 countries. The work of your Center for Anglican Community Studies is vital. In the wake of deep disagreement, growing conflict around the world, the best response is always to work for vigorous cooperation among people of good faith. 
this center is doing just that. And I commend the center, the seminary, all of you who are making the causes of peace and justice your life's work. I greatly appreciated Norman's introduction. I give so many speeches that for me, frankly, the introduction is the highlight of the program. <laughs> it's always nice to hear pleasant things said about you, particularly in front of a group of strangers who don't know the real story. <clears throat> but the risk is, of course, if you hear that kind of stuff often enough, you may begin to believe it, which is very bad for one's mental health. So I like to begin with a story that started in Northern Ireland and an occasion on which I was brought back down to earth. Over a period of five years, I chaired three separate sets of discussions in Northern Ireland. When my work was completed, I returned to my home in Maine. I wrote a book about my experience. When the book was published, I went on a book tour around the country. In the process, I received hundreds of invitations, and I learned the interesting fact that in the United States, there are more Irish American organizations than there are Irish Americans. <coughs> and every one of them invited me. I could only go to some, but I did go and traveled the country. And as I went to these groups, they were quite enthusiastic, and they developed among them an informal competition as to who could give the longest, most fantastic, usually quite ridiculous introductions of me. One guy in Chicago spent 35 minutes reading everything I'd ever done in my life. It was interesting to me because I'd not been aware of much of it until I heard him <laughs> describing it. But when I, the proper reaction, of course, would have been for me to show some humility, to ask them to keep it short, but I had an improper reaction. I loved it. I encouraged them. I scolded them when they left something out. And by the time I got to the last stop on this book tour was in Stamford, Connecticut. I was so overly impressed with myself that I had a hard time squeezing my head through the front door. But when I got in, the first person I encountered was an elderly woman. She rushed up to me, nervous and excited, shook my hand, spent several minutes praising me for my activities around the world. And then she said, I don't live anywhere near here. I drove three hours across the whole state of Connecticut just to ask you, please, would you autograph my poster? And she handed me a poster with a big photograph on it, a pen. I said, I'd be very happy to sign your poster, but before I do, I think there's something I should tell you. She said, what is it? I said, I'm not Henry Kissinger. <laughs> it was a picture of Kissinger. She said, you're not? Well, who are you anyway? And when I told her, she said, why, that's just terrible. She said, I, I drove three hours just to meet, a great, uh, to meet a great man named Kissinger, and all I've got is a nobody like you. I said, well, I'm sorry you feel so bad. I wish there's something I could do. And after a minute, she thought, she said, well, there is. I said, what is it? She leaned forward. I leaned forward. And in a conspiratorial crouch, she said, no one will ever know the difference. <laughs> She said, would you mind signing Henry Kissinger's name <laughs> to my poster? So I did. And it's still hanging on her living room wall in eastern Connecticut, a daily reminder to me to enjoy these kind words from friends like Norman, but don't take them too seriously. I do want to say one word about Norman and Baroness May Blood, who is here from Northern Ireland. They are both dear friends of mine, so close that they have heard me speak more than my kids have heard me talk. And they know every line. They've heard, they were nice to laugh here. They've heard this joke 25 or 30 times. But I, I, I just want to say that they illustrate the kind of people that live in Northern Ireland. They are intelligent. They're thoughtful. They work hard for peace. And my only regret is that they have to hear me again. The American Constitution prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> it does not define the term. 
but surely it includes these two lovely people who happen to hear me speak over and over again. But I want to say again, because I'm going to have to leave quickly at the end to catch a flight. One of the great pleasures of my life was being in Northern Ireland for those years. And after the agreement was reached, I spent 10 years as chancellor of Queen's University in Northern Ireland. Baroness May Blood is a dear friend, someone who I love and admire, and Norman, I've gotten to know very well. He's done such an outstanding job. So in their individual capacities and as representatives of the wonderful people of Northern Ireland, I ask you to join me in recognizing May and Norman. <laughs> <clears throat> 20 years ago this year, uh, the government of Ireland, the government of the United Kingdom, and eight Northern Ireland political parties declared their support for the peace agreement that has come to be known both as the Good Friday Agreement and as the Belfast Agreement. In the current difficult political climate in Northern Ireland, and in light of conflicts raging all around the world, I think it's useful for everyone to recall and to heed the powerful and moving words by which the governments and the parties pledged their commitment to peace. And so I'd like to read just a few sentences from the introduction. The tragedies of the past have left a deep and profoundly regrettable legacy of suffering. We must never forget those who have died or been injured and their families. But we can best honor them through a fresh start in which we firmly dedicate ourselves to the achievement of reconciliation, tolerance, and mutual trust, and to the protection and vindication of the human rights of all. We are committed to partnership, equality, and mutual respect as the basis of relationships within Northern Ireland, between North and South, and between these islands. We reaffirm our total and absolute commitment to exclusively democratic and peaceful means of resolving differences on political issues, and our opposition to any use or threat of force by others for any political purpose, whether in regard to this agreement or otherwise. When I announced the agreement, I described it as an historic achievement, and it was. But I also said on that day that by itself the agreement did not guarantee peace or reconciliation or stability. It simply made them possible. But achieving and sustaining those lofty goals would require of future leaders the vision and the courage that the leaders of Northern Ireland demonstrated in 1998. So my hope today is that the current leaders of Northern Ireland, of Ireland, of the United Kingdom, and of the European Union, as they reflect on their responsibilities, will look back 20 years to what their predecessors did. Much has been said and written about the long and difficult road that led to the agreement. Many have received praise, but the real heroes of the agreement were the people of Northern Ireland and their political leaders. The people supported the effort to achieve the agreement and afterward they voted overwhelmingly to ratify it. Their political leaders in dangerous and difficult circumstances, after lifetimes involved in conflict, summoned extraordinary courage and vision, and they reached agreement at great risk to themselves, to their families, to their political careers. Today, all across the Western world, it's fashionable to ridicule and demean politicians, and surely much of it is well-earned. But we don't pay enough attention or give tribute to those political leaders who do take risks and succeed. In Northern Ireland, these were ordinary men and women, the political equivalent of state legislators 
in our country. But after 700 days of effort, what the press described as 700 days of failure, they joined in one day of success and they changed the course of history. I returned to Northern Ireland often because I love the place and the people. They're energetic and productive. They're a pleasure to be with. It's true they can be argumentative and quick to take offense. One of the delegates to the peace talks, a wonderful man named David Irvine, who May and Norman both knew well, a political leader. He had been a paramilitary leader, arrested for an attempted bombing, served several years in prison, and when he came out, he was totally committed to peace, and he was a key figure in achieving it. When we began the talks, the very first day, he stood up and he said to me, Senator, if you are to be of any use to us here in Northern Ireland, there's one thing you must know. I said, what is it? He said, we in Northern Ireland will drive 100 miles out of our way to receive an insult. <laughs> They're very quick to take offense. Every shoulder had two chips on it. He, David was right, but nobody's perfect. The current problems in Northern Ireland that are difficult, serious, and must be resolved. But at the same time, we should not hold Northern Ireland to a higher standard than we apply to others. Every society, including our own, including the UK and Ireland, all have political problems. I recall when I returned on, in April to be the, in Northern Ireland on the exact date of the agreement, April 10th, as I stepped off the plane, a camera crew was there and a television reporter, and he said to me, isn't it terrible all of this political dysfunction in Northern Ireland. What do you have to say to these leaders in Northern Ireland? And I said, well, I just got off the plane from the United States. <laughs> I said, I don't feel I'm in a position to give anybody else a lecture about political dysfunction. And behind me, waiting in line for his interview, was a guy from London. And I said, they're having problems too. So we can't judge Northern Ireland by one standard and everyone else by another standard. What we can and must do is reaffirm to the people and the political leaders of Northern Ireland our continuing dedication to the principle that political differences must be resolved through democratic and peaceful means, not through violence. Our continuing strong and unwavering encouragement and support our trade, our tourism, our business, all as tangible evidence of our deep concern and our support for their efforts to keep moving forward. The government of the United Kingdom and the European Union last December publicly committed themselves to a Brexit outcome that does not reestablish a hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. We must welcome and accept their decision and insist that they keep their promise. They're now finding out what a lot of us know, that it's easy to make a promise. It can often be very hard to keep the promise, but they must keep that promise. And the governments of both the United States and the United Kingdom must avoid any political or economic decision that costs jobs or create hardship for the people of Northern Ireland. They deserve better than they had during the Troubles. And I th hope that God will bless them with peace, prosperity, and reconciliation. Thank you for having me today, and I look forward to the panel discussion and the questions that will come forward. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Please, please do take a, take a seat. Yes, please. All right. If you'd like to come and join me, that would be great. Sure. If you're looking for a seat, some have become vacant. Come on down. Indeed. 
As, uh, as the panelists are taking their uh, seat, I want to recognize at this juncture um, another uh, important guest that we have in our midst today from the Irish Embassy, the political officer, Brian Cahalian. And he is, Brian is some, right here. It's lovely to have you with us. All right, we have about uh, an hour together, and um, Canon Sarah Snyder and I are going to moderate, and I hope to model that argumentative spirit, and uh, let's see how it goes. <laughs> um, so we want to begin uh, with uh, what the panelists heard. Um, uh, as uh, Senator Mitchell spoke today, what did you hear, and how does that connect with your own work? Bishop Anthony. I think one of the, the things that I heard the senator speak is the fact that leaders who, who make agreements, you know, take great risks in doing that. And I think that really is important. And thinking of where I come from, you know, coming from South Sudan, where our own leaders there had to take a very uh, serious risk of actually, you know, going into conversations with those that they have been in agreement with. I think that, that is something that I thought uh, came out very, very clearly, uh, especially uh, with those, uh, with leaders who have around them those who may not be in favor of any form of agreement because of uh, changes to the status quo. And I thought that is something that came out clearly from what the senator said. I think the second thing I want to add is the, what he said about the pledge that the UK leaders and the European leaders have made uh, for a soft Brexit. I think that is another important thing that I thought is important, particularly now that I live in, in England and have had to hear what's happening and the possibility that, um, you know, unless there was really proper agreement, you know, they would, it would be challenging to the Good Friday agreement. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Baroness Blood, what, what did you hear, even though you've heard it many times, what did you hear today? <laughs> Say I heard it many times, <laughs> but uh, listening to listening to Senator Mitchell, I, my mind obviously went back the 20 years I was involved at that time. One of the things you know in Northern Ireland we're very often accused of is that our troubles was caused by religion, mm. and you notice Senator Mitchell never mentioned it at any time, mm. and that was the big criteria that it was religion, it was Protestants against Catholics, and in fact that wasn't true, but that's what actually came out and. Senator Mitchell was referring to the fact that we now have two names for the agreement 20 years ago, the Good Friday Agreement and the Belfast Agreement. We can't even agree what to call it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm often shy when I refer to it as the Good Friday Agreement, but as far as I was concerned, take away all the religious aspect of that, as far as I'm concerned, it was a Good Friday for the people of Northern Ireland. Now, it wasn't so much the political leaders who took that stand. It was the people on the ground. It was the work that had been done previously, which is done in many countries all over the world. It was people were had had enough and they came together. Now, the only way that could come together was to bring forward the talks and to bring the like of uh, Senator Mitchell to uh, co-host those talks. And today, as many of you know in Northern Ireland, we're still in a difficult position. And someone said to me, do we need Senator George Mitchell back? I said, if we had the Archangel Gabriel, it wouldn't make any difference. <laughs> because in Northern Ireland, unfortunately, in recent years, the dislike of one another has turned to hatred. And that is something I think, as people in this room would be aware, you have to be very careful that you don't allow that to fester. Because the next generation can take that mantle up so easy. I mean, I was born way before the Troubles. I lived through the Troubles, and I know all that. But the one thing I took out of what Senator Mitchell said today was the fact that if you get enough consensus of people, and we're hoping that will happen again, that they want the change, then change will happen. And I think that's what happened around our talks 20 years ago. As George said, it's 700 days argument, and one day they agreed. Why did they agree? Because the people on the ground had enough. And I think we'll get to that. 
Jane. Um, what I heard from uh, Senator Mitchell is that um, the real people, the real heroes, are the people and not the political leaders. And reflecting back to my country, South Sudan, where I come from, I see that the people of South Sudan have suffered enough. And I see them as heroes because since the fighting that has been there over the years, even in the 50s, when some of us were not even thought of, when some of us were not born, these fights have gone on and on and on and on. And the vicious cycle continues. And so I agree that real heroes are the people and not the political leaders. And that is what my people in South Sudan have gone through. And I celebrate them as heroes. Um, the other thing that I had is that it's easy to make a promise, but it's hard to keep them. A lot of agreements have been signed in South Sudan over and over again. And they have been violated. And with the most recent one, which we are yet to see whether it will work out or not, we keep there as a church and pray that this peace will hold this time round, because people in South Sudan have suffered. They have suffered displacement in their own country at the expense of a conflict that is triggered by our own leaders, our own people fighting an ordinary woman, an ordinary child. And sometimes I ask myself, who are our leaders in South Sudan? And who bore these leaders? Why do we kill our own children? Why should we even, as women, have children if they are to be killed? In, in, um, if, I, if I may ask that. And so um, I, 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 I thought that was very, very powerful. Make, it's easy to make a promise, but hard to keep it. Um, the other thing that I also captured is that um, every society has... Um, every society has political problems. Look at the world, all over. Not only my country, there are conflicts everywhere. And where is the problem coming from? I've, I tend to see that it comes from um, uh, selfishness. We are so full of ourselves especially the leaders, the political leaders. They're so full of themselves and at the expense of the other people. And so all I can um, ask is that we need to work together because if a society is at war or a society is not at peace, then the next uh, neighbor is also at conflict. And so the fight moves from one country to the next, and then it becomes a regional, and then eventually uh, it involves the whole society. And so I think we need to really look into that and make our world a peaceful place for the next generations to come. Thank you. Earl. Um, I heard several things. I want to highlight three things that I, I think were, were helpful. Um, one is, is a role of leadership. Uh, one of the things leadership cannot delegate, I heard, is um, the insistence that there is a vision for the future. Um, everything else perhaps could be delegated, but the holding, the championing, the putting out on the table, the bringing people back to the vision for what the future could be has to be a non-delegatable piece. I thought that was important. I thought about certain conflicts that I've been involved with uh, that didn't work out so well, and it's and including some that I was involved in helping to resolve. Uh, I, I would say sometimes if it did not work, it was because we as leaders um, lost sight of that and lost sight of that being a non-delegatable role that we that we have. The second thing dealt with the issue of trust, and I heard the senator speak in various ways about trust. 
And in my context, I have often said, I, th I think trust is probably not a good way to approach this. It's proving ourselves trustworthy that perhaps we should focus on. When I say, you should trust me, that sort of means I'm a good person, I know what I'm about, this, that, and the other about me. Come along, follow what I'm doing, and I'm kind of free still to do what I like. If I'm focused, however, on proving myself trustworthy, it puts the onus on me to really understand what the other needs to see, needs to see, in order to say, I will commit to this for the next step. And I think if we have hungers in our heart about proving ourselves trustworthy and sticking to that, uh, we can perhaps move our resolution a little further down the line. I think all of us talked about um, everyday people. Uh, if, if you were like me when, when I grew up, uh, peacemaking and all of that was the, vis the vision, the, the, the purview of top leadership. They have to be the ones to, to negotiate and barter this out. But what I think all of us heard from the senator is that everyday people have got to do something and to shoulder the risk for it. It reminded me of a book on scenario planning that I read about three, three or four weeks ago. Uh, this section of the book dealt, uh, was in, in Israel, and it was a, to negotiate a conflict between ultra-conservative Orthodox Jews and secular anti-Zionist Jews and everybody in between. Um, and they did lots of stuff, working this out, testing each other. Will you do this? Oh, you won't do it. Back and forth and so on and so forth. They came to a point of conclusion, and I remember that a rabbi from the ultra-Orthodox tradition got up and said this was his outcome. He would not choose a future society that he believed in and that would be positive to him and to his people. But he would choose a society that he wouldn't normally choose. But if that society took his needs and wants into account and included the other, he would pick that. Thank you. Um, Baroness, in light of what you heard today yes. uh, and your long experience in Northern Ireland, what questions are you left with? Well, I'm left with the questions that, you know, in the last 20 years, uh, as the Senator Mitchell said and, and Norman alluded to, Northern Ireland's completely changed. So you're left with the question, you know, some people hark back to the Good Friday or the Belfast Agreement. Can we go back to those days? Are we looking for that exact replica? Or are we looking for something different? And you're quite right, this lady at the end here said, it's about people. And, and you know, when I think about the work that we're doing, uh, I was saying to a friend this morning, actually, you know, we talk a lot about in, in the church, and my, my faith's most important to me. But we talk about that. But I always remember my mother telling me there was no point in being so heavenly mended, you were no earthly use. And I think we have to actually understand that. We have to understand the fact that, yes, we believe we're trustworthy. Yes, we believe because we have a, a good church background, people will automatically come to us. But that's not necessarily true. And I think out of, out of what we learned out of the Good Friday Agreement was we thought that was it. But it wasn't. It's an ongoing process. And when, when the Good Friday Agreement was signed, of course, it was euphoria in Northern Ireland. And everybody was, it, that was it. We had reached, we'd reached the pinnacle. We hadn't. We had actually only reached the bottom of the pyramid because we still have to press on because life changes. And I think we've got to understand that, yes, the Good Friday Agreement was very good and brought a lot of changes to Northern Ireland. But we have moved on. And I think, you know, we have to look. We keep talking about the Good Friday Agreement. We keep talking about it. We keep talking. Is that really the model for the future, or is there something else we could be doing differently? Thank you. <coughs> Senator, would you like to respond? Uh, I want to make a comment on uh, something May said earlier, and then a further comment. Uh, the, we are living through a technological revolution that, in my judgment, history will record as significant a turning point in human history as was the Industrial Revolution, which began 250 years ago in Europe. It has produced the, a, a number of effects, 
And since technology itself is neutral, much of what is produced is simultaneously beneficial and harmful. The volume of information available has grown at a spectacular rate, almost impossible to comprehend, and is so much that it has produced the paradox of oversimplification. We now live by bumper sticker slogans, by 140 character messages, by a reduction to the simplest observation, as though no aspect of human life is complex when we know in reality almost everything about human life is complex. May mention religion. If you asked a thousand Americans what was a Northern Ireland thing all about, 99.9% .9 would say, well, it's Catholics against Protestants, just as May said. Without a doubt, that was a factor, but it was not by any means an exclusive factor, nor even the predominant factor. A year ago, Pope Francis made a very important speech in which he acknowledged that religious differences have been involved in conflict, but he, he pointed out something that needs reemphasizing. Throughout human history, unscrupulous, mostly men, have sought to advance to gain power and to retain power by exacerbating and using religious differences, recognizing that it's much easier to tear down a building than to build a new building. And that's still true today. The conflict in Northern Ireland did have a religious element, but it was not by any means the exclusive element, and it distracts from the element that, in my judgment, underlies all such conflicts, and that is the presence or the absence of opportunity and hope for people. Above all else, people need self-esteem, a sense that they have some worth to themselves, that they have, can get a job, that they can raise their families. The very first day I spent in Northern Ireland, 23 years ago, I remember it as though it were yesterday. I met on their side of the wall in the morning with the nationalists, predominantly Catholic. And then in the afternoon, there's a wall that goes right through the city of Belfast, ironically called the Peace Line, that physically separates the two communities. In the afternoon, I met on their side with the Unionists, predominantly Protestant. They'd been in conflict for nearly a century. They clearly didn't coordinate the messages, but to my surprise, they were almost identical. And they were best illustrated by a young Protestant minister who May and Norman know very well, still around Jackie Redpath, one of the most powerful orators I've ever heard. When we finished, I said to him, you would make a heck of a US senator. <laughs> he brought with him two maps, and he tacked the first one up on the wall, and the title was, unemployment in the urban areas of Northern Ireland. And then he tacked the second one up over it. The title of that was violence in the urban areas of Northern Ireland. And you're not surprised to hear that they fit like a hand in a glove. Where men and women don't have hope, where they don't have opportunity, where they feel excluded or left out, or minimized, there are the ingredients for violence. There are the ingredients for conflict. And you cannot address any conflict in any sustained way unless you address that issue. And it's just as true in this, the most powerful country in all of human history, the United States of America, as it is anywhere else. Probably very few people here remember it, the youngsters don't. But less than 100 years ago, thousands of US military veterans who served in the First World War, who came home to find themselves without jobs, without hope, without opportunity, without any money to help bring food to their children, they gathered on the mall in Washington, just a couple miles from here, to demonstrate, demanding that they have some chance in life. And the response by the government was to break it up, 
with armed troops to disperse them, to arrest them, to dispel them. And then our country plummeted into the Depression when one in four Americans was without work and a frightened nation struggled to survive. This is not, we are not immune to the issues that affect everybody. And you have to make sure that everybody has a sense of self-esteem, an opportunity, a job, so the man can look himself in the eyes. I met a guy who was an armed militiaman in Northern Ireland. And he said to me, when you can't look yourself in the mirror, when you can't look your children in the eye, and someone comes to you and says, here's a gun, here's $100 a week in cash, and you can be the boss of this block, he said, you do things that you know aren't right, but you do them out of desperation. And that, though, that's the central issue. May is 100% right. This, these are not exclusively religious differences. It's a factor. But underlying it all is the powerful motivating factor of the need for self-esteem and dignity for every human being. Thank you so much, Senator. Uh, Bishop Anthony, what, in light of your long time in South Sudan, maybe in, in your other experience too, what are the questions you're left with? I know uh, the Senator mentioned uh, the importance of democracy. And uh, in, in my mind, I was asking this question, a democratic process, perhaps Western democratic process in a context of South Sudan and many other countries in Africa where tribalism is a, is a huge challenge and in Western democracy is the winner take it all. What will happen when perhaps one of the largest tribes or two of the largest tribes then take everything when they win in an election, you know, yet you have emphasized the need and importance of democracy. I just wonder, you know, you know what, what advice you would give you know, in such a context, because if we then followed the Western democratic model, it actually means that we are perpetrating uh, this tribalism in a way. Right. I think that's just something that was coming in my mind as, right. as you were speaking. It's a very important factor, Bishop. The word democracy originated in Greece. Mm. It's a combination of two Greek words, demos the people, kratzi the rule of. The rule of the people. What does that mean? Which people? How many? Who decides? The American experiment in democracy, arguably the most successful in all of human history, is still, however, imperfect. We still struggle with reconciling what I regard as the twin pillars of American democracy. The first is majority rule. You get the most votes, you get the office, you get the power. But we also recognize the threat of unchecked power, even in a majority. So we have in our Constitution a Bill of Rights, which sets forth individual rights that each citizen has that are immune to majority control. We're here in a religious institution. Every American has a right to freely practice whatever religion he or she chooses or not to practice religion. And if the Senate voted 100 to 0, if the House voted 435 to 0, and the President signed a bill saying you cannot practice your religion, it would be null and void and have no effect because it violates our Constitution. Well, it's not easy to reconcile these two conflicts. Look how we're struggling with it. So it is a profound error for Americans to think that we can export American democracy everywhere in the world, whereas you point out life historically for centuries has been tribal or clan or family. And so you need different factors, different elements for each situation. In Northern <coughs> Ireland, the agreement is a power sharing agreement. In Northern Ireland, to get a budget bill passed, the assembly must have a majority of the majority party and a majority of the minority party. You can't ram something down the throats of the opposition just because you have a majority. And so there are any number of 
governing mechanisms, which can be defined as democracy, mm -hmm. that are different from ours, and you need structures that, as close as possible, can conform to the history of the people. And generally, where you have had long and bitter and violent conflict, you need mediating measures to dilute the absolute power of the majority. And that because most non-democratic societies have no tradition of protecting the rights of minorities. Everybody knows about the king running the show. But hardly anybody knows that in order to have a democracy, the king's power must be mediated so that individuals have some right of their own. So I, I, I think we should promote democracy in the broadest sense, but not try to impose precisely American or Western or English-speaking democratic standards on others in the world, and they've got to find their own way. In Northern Ireland, May and Norman will tell you, there's constant people come up and say, well, the Good Friday Agreement should be done away with. It's, time has changed. And there may be a time when the people of Northern Ireland will want to change it, to remove some of the institutional limitations on majority rule that don't exist, but they're necessary because they don't have the same individual rights as in our Constitution. So I think we have to be careful not to feel, be, or act superior, not to feel, act, or be that our way or no way, but give people a right to find their own way to democracy so long as they meet the principal challenge of no violence and purely democratic and peaceful means of acquiring and exercising power. Thank you so much, Senator. I'm so relieved to hear you speak. I wish you could be on primetime television saying these things. <laughs> um, yeah. We had uh, lots of wonderful questions. Um, and I'm just going to invite Elizabeth, wherever you are, to ask yours. Um, how has your faith background impacted your work? Thank you. That's for you, please, Senator. Yeah. Well, it's been a powerful factor uh, in my life. And I have to tell you, <laughs> we all sit here and celebrate this agreement in Northern Ireland. And looked at through the prism of subsequent events, it's a great thing. But keep in mind that for five years, there was failure. For five years, there was continuing violence. For five years, we made very little progress, and often there were regressions. And I think in the absence of faith, it would have been impossible to keep going. Uh, and I think what one of the great things that faith does for humans is to create a sense that there is always something better. That as difficult and trying as times and circumstances are, you got to keep moving forward and searching for a better alternative. And that, that did very much help me uh, keep going. And I, I'll say, I, I described this in the book, a crucial turning point for me was the birth of my son. Uh, we'd, we'd been at it three years. We had no, uh, no success. It was unbelievably negative. And, and uh, we, uh, uh, Mayor will remember this, we, we, I had a meeting of the political leaders in Northern Ireland just before Christmas. And I said to them, well, I know we can't get any answers, there, but can we at least agree on the questions? Agree on what the issues are to be solved. I'm not asking for solutions or answers, just agree on the issues. And we'd been there three years, and we couldn't get agreement on that. And I was so depressed. And... Uh, I went home, my son was born, and as I held him in my arms, he was one day old, the first day of his life. I began to think about all the things my wife and I wanted for him. And then I asked myself, I, I, I wonder how many kids were born in Northern Ireland today? Same day as my son. So I, I called my office in Belfast, and I found out right away, 61. And so the number stuck with me, 61 kids whose parents want the same things 
for them in life. And they can't get it. What if my son had been born in Northern Ireland? What if those kids had been born here? And so uh, I thought about leaving, but I then resolved to go back and to try to finish the job. And thank God it worked out. Thank you, Senator. Jane, would you reflect a little on how your faith impacts your response to these issues? One of the things uh, I would mention is that um, I've never regretted um, uh, when I got to know the Lord as a young teenager. And that has kept me. And even when I met my husband, I already committed my life to Christ. And so that kept me strong in the faith. And when I get challenges or difficulties, I always look to the cross which is my stronghold. And so uh, it has given me resilience, even in the situation that is in our country. I look at it with a lot of resilience and that there is hope at the end of it. Because uh, I believe there's nothing that um, goes on forever. And so um, this has also impacted my work in the, uh, um, as a reconciler. And so in the uh, last couple of years, uh, before myself and my husband came to work at Lambeth, I used to work with a Justice, Peace and Reconciliation Commission, uh, which is an umbrella of the province, province of the Episcopal Church of South Sudan and Sudan. And we have been engaging and working with the bishops to see how they can be um, role models and also how they can bring the prophetic role of the church in the situation that it is in, in South Sudan. And so we have been engaging with the bishops as they move on to bring about peace and just to push to see that something comes out of the conflict that is there in South Sudan. And so when I moved to, uh, to the UK with my husband, um, I'm grateful that I'm able to be part of the women on the front line, uh, which is part of the Archbishop's Reconciliation Ministry. And so uh, having worked with bishops, one of the things we look at is also to engage the bishops' wives because most of the time, the bishops' wives or women in general are not so active in the peace processes that, they are there, that are there. And so how can we engage women in the churches to also be peacemakers and reconcilers? And so this has also uh, given me, um, has impacted in my work, the faith that I gained when I was growing up to have women as reconcilers and uh, contribute in peace building process. Thank you, Jane, very much. Oh, may I invite you to reflect? Jane, you know, I really enjoyed hearing how early on you made a commitment to Christ. And you said that uh, you can back into the cross for, for everything. Um, and then you shared <clears throat> afterwards that um, about a change in your context. You went from South Sudan to England. And when you were in England, you, you had a more global um, experience as opposed to a local experience. I imagine being local meant that you were closer to the ground personally, whereas when you went global, you maybe became more a relator to people who were closer on the ground. Could you say anything for us about how your faith sustained you in those two different kinds of settings? Did you get different challenges that um, came to you when you were close to the ground that were different challenges when you became more a, an equipper of others who were close to the ground? Thank you. One of the things that um, I found was very, very painful to part, and also I find it as a blessing, was when um, I had to leave my own country um, to come to a, a world where there is comfort. And here, my people are in the displaced people's camps, they have fled to the refuge, and here I am. And so, um, 
when we came here, we, 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 I was able to share this with the women on the front line. And so I visited South Sudan and met with the women uh, bishops' wives and to hear their stories of the displacement that has come about uh, as a result of the conflict and what they are doing and what is it that women on the front line can be able to help to be, you know, to be of any support or of any help in the work of uh, peace and uh, reconciliation. And so what happened is um, we were able to give them uh, three, two to three days training by Massey Ministries International from Rwanda to run through them, uh, through the women on how the people in Rwanda were able to go through the genocide that, that happened and how they were able to be reconciled among the communities that are there. And so what happened is two of the women were sent to Rwanda for training and now they are back in Juba to become trainers of trainers as peacemakers and reconcilers in their own dioceses and communities. And so that gives me a more global perspective. The fact that I'm here is a blessing because I can be a voice of the people back home in South Sudan. And I also happened to visit the refugee camps. And one of the things that I discovered was the situation was very, very appalling. You look at children and they're not able to go to better schools. And so I asked myself, where is the future of these children? Because myself, I grew and um, I, I was born and grew up in refuge. And so I look at these children, where is their future? And what is it that I can be able to do to make these children live in a peaceful country for once? And what is it that I can do to break this cycle of you know, violence that goes on and on and on and on? And so where I am, um, I'm advocating that the world um, represented globally can be able to be a voice of the voiceless in South Sudan. And in my own capacity, if I'm able to bring peace to my country, that is my prayer and my hope. Thank you, Jane. Al, well, do you want to add anything about your own, um, your own faith and what, what, what the, what your faith, how your faith uh, feeds the work and the ministry that you have? <laughs> for some people, that's a silly question because it's so obvious, but not for everyone. Mm. <laughs> Um, I would say before I started to work for my denomination, uh, a lot of my work, uh, whether it was in the church or in the government, was fairly um, close to the ground level, fairly grassroots. Uh, I knew people, knew their stories, could see progress over time or regression over time or marking place over, I could do that. I started working for the denomination and I had resources. I knew what to do with those things and where to go when I was feeling whatever I was feeling. I started working for a denomination and at that level I was about four steps removed from what was happening on the front line. And for a long time that was extremely frustrating. I didn't know people's stories and if I did I didn't know how reflective they actually were. I didn't, I wasn't in a position to really see progression, regression, marking time, I just kind of got dropped in, and then I had to pick up and move. And for me, that, that um, threw me back on trying to find some new resource uh, from God, uh, and also from others who have been in that situation longer than I have, uh, to try to find stability. Thank you. I can relate to that. <laughs> uh, Matthew, where are you? It'd be great to hear your question, please. Thank you. Thank you. So my question actually refers to something that you, the, the, the panel has already alluded to. Unfortunately, it's a fact that uh, sustainable peace has proved quite elusive. Uh, so what, in your opinion, are then the grassroots level uh, initiatives that can sustain communal peace building and reconciliation? And the second, on the, on the other hand, what is the role the religious leaders can play in that process? Thank you so much. Baroness, would you like to... 
Well, I can take the second part of your question first, and here I've got to be very critical. Uh, quite frankly. Second part of the question is, uh, what in this sustainable peace uh, process, uh, what's the role of the relig religious leaders yes, in that? Yes, I know that? what you said, uh, but I'm saying I respond to it first. I, I'd be very critical. During the years of the Troubles in Northern Ireland, most of the churches took a back step. It didn't apply to them. Their congregation went along on Sunday. That was okay. Closed the doors and went home. And I was very critical, particularly of my own uh, I, I'm a Protestant. On the Protestant side of, the, of it, I was very critical because on the Catholic side, they seemed to have the doors of their church open more. They seemed to respond to their community more. They met the community needs more. I have to say on the Protestant side, I didn't find that. And I found it very, very, very disappointing. And I, I've said that at home. I get into a lot of trouble for saying, of course. But uh, that doesn't really matter to me. Uh, because I think, you know, if... And we were talking here today, and I'm listening to what you're saying. It's very, very important that we don't promise people on the ground and then walk away. Because part of the Good Friday Agreement was there were a number of things promised in the Good Friday Agreement. 20 years on, at least six of them have never, never been fulfilled. And they all pertain to community on the ground. We were, and we were told we would have a Bill of Rights. We were told there was a number of things was all told at that time. We were to have a civic forum, which ordinary people would have a say in government. None of that. Well, the civic, the civic forum was in vogue for about a year and then collapsed because our elected leaders didn't want it anymore. We had fulfilled our time. We had promised. We had voted. And we put them in. And George is quite right. When you say, you know, now they are elected, let them get on. If we're going to uh, really talk to people on the ground, and, and I work in some really deprived areas, we have got to really not make promises that we have no intentions of fulfilling because nothing turns people off more. And talking about, uh, we were talking earlier about democracy. I asked a minister in the House of Lords recently a question about, uh, I would have preferred a, a referendum around certain things, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, I asked him, and he said to me, you're talking about democracy, but there's also representative democracy. And I said to myself, I wonder what that is. <laughs> he says, democracy is when people vote. You vote people in, and then that's representative. They tell you what they're going to do. That's what's wrong. If you promise people on the ground, and most of the people here who work through churches and know what I'm talking about, if you make promises on, the, on people that's down there, you've got to be very sure that you're going to fulfill those promises or you're going to be left with a, a worse disaffected. And that is what happened in Northern Ireland. Ordinary people on the ground, after 20 years, yes, there's plenty of work. Yes, Northern Ireland's looking well. Yes, there's a good lot going on. But you still have a core of people who feel they got nothing out of the agreement. And that is what we have to be very careful of in any agreement in any country, that you take the people along with you. And for me, that is a big thing. I don't believe the church has played that part. And, and, and it's been a bane in my life. And as I say, I get into trouble for saying it. I go to church every Sunday. I'm a Presbyterian. God help me. But, <laughs> uh, you know, to my part, my church isn't part of my community. It's somewhere I go on a Sunday and then the doors are closed. <laughs> and that, to me, is not, not real Christian. Gosh, what a challenge for us. Thank you. Senator, would you like to add anything to this recent discussion? I've never been able to add to the wisdom of Mayflower. <laughs> 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 <It's> wonderful. <laughs> 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 Robert, over to you then. Thank you. So academic year 2018-19 at the centre, uh, our theme is the communion in the Middle East. A range of visitors will be here on campus. A group of students will visit Oman. Someone has to. And the June, we have a June writer's retreat in Jerusalem. So Middle East is very much uh, our focus this year. Senator Mitchell, you wrote about the ongoing conflict in the Middle East, and this is what you said. I disagree with those who have concluded that the conflict cannot be resolved. So I guess the question is, on what do you base that judgment and then we've asked this question again and again here. What are particular skills that religious, civic, political leaders should be working on? So 
on what do you base the judgment, and what are the skills that people need to develop to make peace work? Uh, the historical reality, of course, is that every conflict comes to an end one way or another. There is either the total defeat and obliteration of the loser, or there is a negotiated settlement. Uh, and I believe, having done two tours of duty in the Middle East under three presidents, having spent much, much time there, uh, I believe with all my heart and soul that the, the specific issue of Israelis and Palestinians is going to be resolved, for better or for worse. The larger issues of the upheaval in the region are going to continue for some time, but we should not be surprised or condescending about that. The history of Western democracy is conflict for a long period of time. Sixty years elapsed between the French Revolution and the establishment of the French Republic. In England, 200 years. There are in the historian, certainly in Alexander and Washington, there may be one or two in London who can, who can remember all the ins and outs of the wars of the, for, con, for establishing what ultimately became to be a constitutional monarchy in England. For 500 years, the people in the Middle East were governed by others. For 400 years, it was the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, based in Istanbul. And while they share the religion of Islam, they are ethnically quite different, with a long history of hostility. When the Ottoman Empire collapsed in the aftermath of the First World War, the British and the French, in their colonial modes, had made a secret deal to carve up control of the region. And they decided what would happen to the people there with no regard whatsoever for the interests of the people who actually lived there. In Versailles, on a large conference table, a map was spread on the table, and a British civil servant took out a pencil and a ruler and drew the lines that created two countries that had never existed, Iraq and Jordan, without any regard for the tribal histories there. You, you read in the papers today what's going on in Yemen. Yemen, for centuries, was tribal. There's, a, there's an interesting history written by a, a, a British civil servant who became the first Western or European to cross the Arabian Desert on foot. His name was Wilfred Thesiger, a very interesting guy. And his, the whole book is about how you'd go a mile and there'd be another tribe, and then you'd go another couple of miles, there'd be another tribe. Now, most of them were families centered on sources of water, rare in the region. So a family controlled an oasis, and that became a city-state, and that became a nation. That's the Sauds now, and the Qataris, and the UAE, and the others. And to just impose, as the British did, a, a lines with mixed up groups, and picked out, they picked out the favored group, and impose them in power. So it's a very difficult thing, and it's going to be a long time. I mean, Germany, Italy, the European countries, France were formed after centuries of internal conflict. Ireland, where, where we spent time for thousands of years, was little local kingdoms uh, fighting for control. Here's a very interesting part of history. The British domination of Ireland began 800 years ago. And it was a consequence of an internal struggle in Ireland between two competing clans for control of the island. And the side that was losing called on a British warlord, name was Earl Strongbow, good archer, who had, an, who had a militia. He came to help what was the losing side in the Irish Civil War, and they won. The Earl Strongbow was a rival of the King of England. The King was so upset about Earl Strongbow over there, he sent the British Army over. And so here you had the British took control and held it for 800 years as a consequence of an internal struggle there. This is true all over the place. It's going to be quite a while in the Middle East before the upheaval settles down and countries choose their own way. And I must say, I don't want to get political, but we're not helping much right now. Uh, now, Israelis and Palestinians are going to reach an agreement at some point because it is so much in their interest. The alternatives, there are no good alternatives. And what you find when you get into these 
governing conflict situations is you don't have a good choice and a bad choice. You've got a really bad and a terrible choice. And choosing among them is the challenge of leadership. It does, this doesn't make any sense for the Palestinians, and it doesn't make any sense for the Israelis. And I, I'll tell you what I told both of them. I told Netanyahu, you're in a strong position now. You've come from being the underdogs to being the dominant power in the Middle East, and you have the guarantee of the United States for your security. Make a deal. Make a few concessions. It will be politically difficult. The Israeli right wing will strongly oppose any concession of any kind, but you're in a strong position. I said to Arafat and then to Abbas, you're in a very weak position. In 1947, the United Nations proposed a partition which would create a Palestinian state and an Israeli state and make Jerusalem an international city. The Israelis accepted. The Arabs, thinking that they could easily defeat the only 600,000 Jews then in Israel, oh, we can kill them all and push them into the sea. They refused the offer of peace, and six of them invaded Israel. Over the years, the Israelis have gotten more dominant, the offers have gotten less attractive, and the Palestinians have spurned them all. And I said to Arafat, you're waiting 60 years for the perfect solution to come floating down from heaven, and it's never coming. You've got to get in the room. You've got to negotiate. You've got to make a deal. You've got to get a state. Imperfect. You'll think it's not fair. It's not 100%, but it's better than 60 more years of living the way they've been living. And neither one of them will budge because they don't think the negotiations will succeed, and they blame the other guy. Netanyahu thinks that Abbas doesn't have the strength or the political will to make and keep a deal, and Abbas doesn't think Netanyahu tells the truth. And he cites the fact that Netanyahu in his political career has been against the two-state solution, then for, then against, then for, now for with conditions. So probably take new leadership. But there's going to come a leader who's going to say, this is not good for us. We're better off making a deal, imperfect, but at least then we'll be able to get on with the business. And for the Israelis, they're very dominant now, but the demographics are daunting. Right now, in the region between the Jordan River and the Red Sea, there's about six and a quarter million Jews and about six and a quarter million Arabs. And the birth rates are such that within five years, there'll be a half million more Arabs, and within 20 years, there'll be a couple of million more Arabs. Looking at the larger demographics, the number of Jews by 2050 will grow to 12 million. The number of Arabs will grow to 600 million. And the number of Muslims will grow to three and a half billion. Three and a half billion was the total population of the world as recently as 1970. And it is a dangerous thing for any Israeli leader to look at those demographics, to look at the turmoil in the United States, and to say, we don't have to do anything. They're going to have to do something because the demographics are going to overwhelm them, and the time to make a deal is when you're in a strong position. Thank you. We have lots of other questions, but I'm going to have to give Baroness Blood the last word. Um, that's pro probably That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Baroness Blood, I want us to come in a way full circle. We began with the people. We began with talking about grassroots, ordinary people having to step up and make the difference. Mm -hmm. In many respects, that has been your life. You were a shop steward. You were in the forefront in local communities, building community, building peace, founding an all-women's coalition political party. So just to come back full circle, and we're particularly invested in this question. What are the skills that people in communities and at the grassroots need to be developing to be peace builders, to, to, to make a difference? Well, I think a simple answer to that would be you have to build up people's own con confidence and skills in themselves. Because sometimes, and the people I would work among, sometimes you're looking at third and fourth generation 
of this mess in their lives. So you have to start at the beginning. That's why I'm so interested in integrated education, because I think it's one of the things that could make a big difference in Northern Ireland. Because uh, as many of you know in the room, we have a Protestant uh, education system and very much a Catholic education system, and none of the twain shall meet. We have tried to change that over the years. A small group of us have tried to change that by putting in schools where children of all faith are taught. Now, if you start at that early age, you build up that confidence in the community that they can actually make that difference. And I was listening to George, and, and I, I wouldn't dare contradict George, but I was listening to him about Palestine and, uh, and the Israel thing. I have to tell you, George, there is a movement coming which will change all that, the women. I was, I was talking to... The, <laughs> I was talking to a group of women in Belfast a few weeks ago, and I was amazed at the amount of people. And this is an initiative that actually started in America. Hillary Clinton and all was involved in it. And it has now grown. And these women are having a big conference in Tel Aviv, and they showed me their tents, hundreds and hundreds of them. And sitting where I am in Belfast, I thought that didn't happen. But that's what happened in Northern Ireland. It was the women changed the thinking in Northern Ireland. And I, that will come again. But in, in the case of, of integrated education, I believe if we can bring children from a very early age to learn that he doesn't have anything more than I have, we're equal. It's the same in every country. I think, you know, we can bring children up and let them grow with the confidence that they have a stake in their own community. Before they look outside, they have a stake in their own community. Then I think that's the answer to it. And that's why for years I've been deeply involved in, in all aspects of community work. And that's why in the answer to the question the gentleman asked earlier, you know, you have to really, you have to, you have to tell people on the ground, they can make that difference. But you've also got to make the road that makes that difference for them because they can't do it for themselves. And I would love the churches to be the main role in that. I would really love it, and I know in some countries that's perfectly true, but it isn't true in Northern Ireland. We have to get there. And earlier, the question about faith. My faith is very important to me. My faith means five things to me. It's the foundation of my life. It has always been the foundation of my life. My faith has opened up so many avenues of work for me in all the things that you mentioned. My faith inspires me when I look at people like yourself, and I could only... On, I could only listened to what's going on there, and I thought, my country is bad, your country may be worse, maybe somebody else's country. But my faith inspires me that faith can make that difference. But the two vital things in faith for me is truth. And I was asked once, did I believe that we should have a similar South African peace thing about truth? And I said, well, whose truth are we talking about in Northern Ireland? Because everybody will tell you they started it. It wasn't me, it was them. And, you know, I believe, I believe we've got to get that truth out. And we've got to accept that it mightn't be as comfortable as we would like it. I mean, I had relatives killed during the, the Troubles. I was burned out of my home by Protestants, simply because I chose to help my Catholic neighbours. But you don't carry all that on your back. You get on and you try to make a change for the next generation. And, you know, um, President Obama said once when he came to Northern Ireland that we owe it to our children to make a better future for them. And I think for all of us in this room, wherever we come from, that should be our guiding principle. But the last initial in the word faith is H. And my, this is where my faith really kicks in. My faith gives me hope. I was asked earlier at lunch, I was saying earlier at lunch that I was uh, interviewed by the BBC recently who asked me, was I optimistic or pessimistic about Northern Ireland? It would be very easy to be pessimistic about Northern Ireland. I said, I'm optimistic because I do not believe the people of Northern Ireland can afford to be pessimistic. And it's the same in all our countries. Good people will eventually win in the end. And that's the one thing I hold on to. It only remains for me to say thank you, really. Uh, I feel like I shouldn't say anything after that. Um, thank you. I want to thank Senator George Mitchell, as always, his analytic mind is articulate and inspiring and I want to think also thank also all our panelists my co-host Canon Snyder for today for those of you in the room for those of you online 
Um, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, you got to go. <laughs>